Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. My name is Tom Tobin, president of the club, and we're thrilled to have you join us today. This meeting broadcast is available on HCTV as well as our Rotary of Hudson YouTube channel. Our club meets weekly at Laurel Lake for breakfast on Wednesday mornings from 7.15 to 8.30. Come out and join us for a meeting. We would love to have you as a guest. To learn more about Rotary, our club, and the impact we're having on our local community and the world, visit our website, rotaryhudson.org. Enjoy the meeting today and help us share the message that Rotary connects the world. Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Good morning, Ron. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. I'm Ron Strobel, the Sergeant at Arms. Our invocation this morning is by Jim Young. Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Well, as we've had a Thanksgiving weekend and we look towards the next season of joy and hope, let us pray. For friends, food, fun, and the fellowship of Rotary, we give our thanks today. As we ask your blessing for this meal, let us always be mindful of the amazing gifts that life has given each of us. Let these thoughts guide our lives today. Amen. Thank you, Jim. And to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, John Hopkins. Good morning, Rotarians. Good morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, John. And to lead us in song, Chris Barker. And to introduce our guests, Chris. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. First, I'd like to um, introduce some wonderful guests with us today. Okay, walking through the door, we have friends of Mayor Dave Basil. They're here to join us today. And then in addition to this wonderful group, they'll have a few minutes here. We have Dave Zero, President of the Hudson Board of Education. Thank you. And then Joe Avella has three guests with him today. Mike Gladstone, his beautiful wife Carol, and Louise McCorkle. And then Jim Lang has a guest today, Greg Fratz. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, a big thank you to Rotary for letting us hijack your meeting for just a minute or two. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not alone in looking forward to working with Dave Basil again on one of Hudson's various committees and organizations. But in the meantime, we thought it was important to honor the contribution he's made uh, and how he has served us and Hudson for so many years. Uh, we wanted to give him something he could take with him and would show him all, just all the people who love, respect, and admire him. 
Uh, so we have this plaque, which was created by Matt Gerber from Western Reserve Academy in the Innovation Center. And many, many of your friends have signed it. Uh, the front has now been covered and um, polyurethane, but if anybody hasn't signed and want to, you can sign the back, and then we'll polyurethane that. <laughs> so Dave, would you come up, please? This is more than a surprise. <laughs> uh, if you ask my son, this probably will be the first time I've ever been speechless in my life. <laughs> um, I, I can't thank everybody in Rotary and especially all of the folks who made a special effort to come out this early in the morning. Uh, this will go in a very treasured spot uh, on the shelves in my study. Um, and like you, Liz, I'll look forward to working with everybody. I know there are a lot of opportunities, and you know, a lot of folks have reached out already, so um, you know, I'm not going anywhere. All right, good, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Deb Basil really wanted to be here, but she said if she got up this early and put on her makeup, he would know something was going on. <laughs> And now we'll leave you to your meeting. Thanks again so much. <laughs>
Our Santa um, is uh, had knee surgery and cannot do it this year. Um, and the holiday will go on, but we uh, we do need that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to add is that uh, if you have a hub um, from the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Bill Wolderidge was Citizen of the Year. If we can have a nice round of applause for him, he has. Bill went around and stole every hub from all of his neighbors. So if you do have hubs, he wants to go ahead and give this as Christmas presents to his kids. So uh, please uh, bring those in next week, and we'll uh, uh, tack on Fine Day. Uh, the other thing is we're looking at Fine Day for this month. Uh, I was watching the news this morning, and normally we raise between $150 to $200 to give to some type of a charity. Uh, this month, I'm going to propose that we um, give it to the Cleveland Indians to be able to retain Francisco Lindor. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right, just a couple other little uh, pieces of information here. Uh, first of all, service learning presentations. Mike Swain wanted me to thank you all, commend you all for uh, the time that uh, many of us have, have contributed to attending the uh, service learning class presentations, which I think revolve around policy changes and random acts of kindness. And uh, I think that's been uh, very helpful to students and, and very enjoyable for our members. So thank you for doing that. Uh, let's see. Phil Wart Warburton, could I have you step up? And... Um, I also want to mention, okay, um, I had asked you all to circle December 5th as a date for having a, uh, for participating in a special focus group slash social in the evening. That one, due to conflicts, we're going to have to postpone. I'll get back to you with dates on that. Um, so yesterday was, I believe, Giving Tuesday, Phil. I didn't know if we discussed that or not. But no, it's uh, good to know that, though. It's a, it's a, <laughs> so, so this is, so this is very timely that uh, Phil's message this morning. So Phil, if you take it away. Well, this is a message for us all. And I'm going to spring training camp in South Carolina this afternoon. So I wanted to let you know that. This morning we're talking about planned giving. And, uh, before I do that, I want to speak about planning your estate. I'm an inactive lawyer, which means I'm not practicing and not retired. I have 40 years. That's good. That's good. Experience, I've had 40 years experience in one manner or another from practicing law to financial planning for small businesses and professional people to managing a private foundation, to serving on a plan giving committee at a small college. I know how important estate planning is to the individual. That means all of you. Some of you have taken steps to plan towards planning. Some of you have not. Some of you have completed your plan. Some of you need to update it. Somewhere we all fit into this. If you know who you are and you know that inevitably you should do something, one thing is inevitable. We all are going to pass on at some point in time. What happens if we do nothing? Well, the government, specifically the state of Ohio, does it for you. This is done through the statute of dissent and distribution. What things can you do to avoid this statute? First and foremost is you should make a will. This gives you an opportunity to make sure your estate is left to the individuals you choose, not letting the state of Ohio do it for you. By doing this, you avoid probate and the expenses that that entails, among other things. There are more complex ways you can do, as well as, for example, a trust, life insurance, annuities, etc. Now let's talk about the Rotary Club of Hudson and how it might fit into your estate plan. First, we all have an affection for Rotary. We know what it does locally and internationally. This includes 
helping to eradicate polio, and many other things. Let's talk about our club and its charitable arm, the Hudson Rotary Foundation. It was chartered in November 1997. It, <coughs> it is the charitable arm of the Rotary Club of Hudson. It's a 501c3 nonprofit <coughs> organization. Meetings are held every two months, and all of you are welcome. Total spending since 1997 is over $750,000. Planned giving objectives, areas of focus, youth and education, scholarships, Hudson Community, international projects. <coughs> I'm getting over a cold, so bear with me, please. And just as important as the above, sp specific areas of your interest, you can direct where you want the Rotary Foundation to make grants to organizations or entities you like. <coughs> we can help you plan more specifically. Now let me talk about charitable bequest gifts. A charitable bequest can be made in your will or trust and is one of the easiest ways you can leave a lasting impact on the causes and charities you love. Bequ benefits of your bequest you receive an estate tax deduction, lessen the burden of taxes. Oh, thank you very much. You lessen the burden of t taxes on your family. You leave a lasting legacy. How do you make a bequest? With the help of an advisor, you can include language, in your will or trust specifying a gift to be made to your family, friends, Hudson Rotary Foundation, or Rotary International. Some examples of other ways to give besides cash are stocks and bonds, retirement assets, and life insurance. How can you, how can you be involved? You have the opportunity to create a legacy and make a huge impact without committing money or assets now. Estate planning options can maximize future charitable gifts. And I want to say this. For most people, it's easier to give money after they've passed than it is to give money now. A huge impact without committing money or assets now. Estate planning options can maximize future charitable gifts, provide you with income today, and, limited ta and limit tax exposure. In addition, your professional advisor should be involved with the conversation if you wish. We have placed a form on the tables, each of your tables. We would like you to fill them out, fill it out, and return them to me or return them to Joe Avella, or return them to Tom Tobin. For additional information, Hudson Rotary Foundation Plan Giving Committee is composed of Phil Warburton, and myself, Rich Warfield, Phil Tobin, Joe Avella, and the Hudson Community Foundation, the Rotary International Foundation, I want to thank you for listening to me this morning, and I hope you work on your estate plan and include Hudson Rotary Foundation in it. The end. <laughs> All right, Phil, I'm going to put you on the spot with one question here. Have you made Hudson Rotary Foundation part I'm of your I'm working on it. Plan? All right, good, good. <laughs> That's that's it. I mean, because I, I and and I want everyone to know that uh, that uh, Gail and I, uh, Gail Tobin and I are are making are doing the same, and so you're not going to be alone. If you when you talk to your attorney, um, have the discussion. And you don't have to talk to your attorney. Well, you don't have to. Yourself. Yeah, that's true. Talk to talk to your wife though, right? Yeah, talk to, your, talk to your, wife. your wife. That's where the start. All right, good. All right. If I may invite Jim Lang up to the lectern to introduce our guest for today. Thank you, and I'll tell you what, 
Ed Sogan's not the only one that can wear a prop up here. And this is not, this is official. This is fantasy camp garb. Oh! <clears throat> and you get two. You get a blue and a red one. You get a nice jacket. So if you want to go, it's really worth it. And spend time with guys like Bob DiBiasio and ex-Indians. Ex and it's like testosterone on <laughs> steroids. It's unbelievable. Jim, do you get an injury with that, too? Oh, your injuries, but do you have, you have guys that rub you down. Oh, okay. You got ice baths. You got ice whirlpool. I, I mean, I'm taking up Bob's time. Anyways, thank you. Anyway, Bob DiBiasio is in his 41st season with the Cleveland Indians and his 42nd in Major League Baseball. He started with the Tribe in 79 as assistant PR director, named PR director in 80, and vice president of PR in 88. <clears throat> I'm skipping some stuff because I want him to get up here. Uh, Bob serves as president of the Cleveland Indians Charities. He's an honorary member of the executive board of the Boys and Girls Club of Cleveland, serves on the athletic advisory board of Notre Dame College in Ohio, and is a member of the Board of Directors <clears throat> of the Cuyahoga County Public Library Foundation, the Bob Feller Act of Valor Foundation, and the base and Baseball Heritage Museum at League Park. <clears throat> DiBiasio is the host of the popular Indians Alumni Roundtable Show <clears throat> on uh, Sports Time Ohio, as well as Tribe Tales, a where they are now segment is really popular <clears throat> and airs pregame every Sunday on the Indians Radio Network. He was the 1999 recipient of the prestigious Robert O. Fischel Award for Public, <clears throat> Public Relations Executive in Major League Baseball. He was inducted into the Lakewood, Lakewood High School Distinguished Alumni Hall of Fame in 99. In 1986, Bob was named the Public Relations Director to the Sports Illustrated's Dream Team. Uh, Bob graduated Lakewood High in 73, earned a degree in journalism and education from Ohio Wesleyan in 77. While at Wesleyan, Bob was the sports editor of the, sports pa of the school paper, the transcript, the student sports information director, and did color on Ohio Wesleyan University football and basketball broadcasts. He also played one year of basketball and two years of baseball at Ohio Wesleyan. In 78, he earned a master's degree in journalism from the Ohio State University and started as an assistant sports ed editor at the Fremont News Manager before joining the Indians. Bob and his wife, Penny, reside in Solon, Ohio, right up the street. They have two adult children, daughter Julie and her husband Matt and son Patrick and his wife Liz. So please join me in a warm welcome for Bob DiBiasio. Yeah, I thought you were going to be quick. Um, thank you. But I appreciate that, Mr. Lang. I appreciate that. You still look good in your uniform. Um, you know, I always consider this, I think I've mentioned it a number of times, I don't know how many years in a row we've done this at this time of year, and it's always a, a treat to be back and, and enjoy uh, sharing a, a tribe talk with you all. But I, I, I consider this the first pitch of uh, the, uh, the new season. Um, there's some markers along the way. <clears throat> and for me, this is number one. Um, winter meetings, baseball's winter meetings are coming up this uh, weekend. Um, they're in San Diego. So there might be some crazy news coming out of there in the world of baseball. Um, then we uh, head to fantasy camp in January. We will do Tribe Fest uh, the beginning of February. And then uh, spring training gets in gear and we're ready to go for another exciting season. So uh, I, I do thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk Cleveland Indians baseball with you. Uh, we'll revisit last year briefly. We'll talk about expectations for the 2020 season and entertain any questions that you might have. 
Uh, think about, obviously, the incredible history that's involved with the Cleveland Indians organization. Uh, the year 2020 will be our 120th season as a member of the American League, as a charter member of the American League. It's remarkable. 1901 was the inaugural season of um, the American League. We're one of the four charter members. And when I do the little history lesson for our new employees at the Cleveland Indians, um, mostly young people, I tell them I'm going to give them a little bit of news that will get them a beer at a bar when they're in downtown Cleveland. A lot of kids that come to work for us like to live downtown and they'll sit in the, an establishment and the, get into a conversation and somebody will say, what do you do? And they go, oh, I work for the Cleveland Indians. And I say, well, your very next line should talk about the great history of the Cleveland Indians and we're one of the four charter members of the American League. And ask the person if they get any of the four teams right that you'll buy them a beer. If they get it wrong, you get a beer. What do you think the first team is that everybody thinks was one of the four charter members in addition to the Indians? Okay. Wrong. You owe me a beer. <laughs> Chicago, Boston, Detroit, and Cleveland were the four uh, charter members of the American League. So a um, little history. If you learn anything today, I'll get you a beer at a bar uh, uh, when you leave here. Um, it's going to be our 27th season at Progressive Field. Think about that for a second, too. How quickly those 27 <laughs> years have gone by. Uh, we've had, out of the uh, 26 seasons that we've played, we've had 17 winning seasons. It's partly why we think it's gone by so fast, because we've had so much fun in that incredible building down on the corner of Carnegie in Ontario. 17 winning seasons. Think about it. That's a 65% winning percentage for a teeny bit over a quarter of a century. Not bad. 45 postseason games. We've entertained three World Series. We had two All-Star games. Last year's All-Star Game was one for the ages. Major League Baseball and the national media truly uh, talked about how incredible the city of Cleveland is. All we prayed for was good weather for the All-Star Week, simply because we knew because we're a walkable city and we're a friendly group of people that we were going to have one of the greatest All-Star Games in many years. I don't know how the L.A. Dodgers are going to try to come near us. They're not very walkable town to have all the things that go on within uh, a couple mile radius. Um, the ballpark is a mile away from the convention center in Cleveland and all the play ball park and all the activities. Just absolutely remarkable. When you go, talk about a baseball season, there are three elements, I believe, that come into play. The first one is elation. The second one is frustration. And the third one is discovery. So we'll talk about each of those briefly. Um, elation. Well, we had our seventh straight winning season. Uh, no coincidence that uh, the great skipper, Tito Francona, uh, has been there for all seven of those that uh, our franchise uh, made a turn forward when Chris Antonetti, Paul Dolan, and uh, Mike Chernoff, the, the guys that uh, in uh, the baseball operations, and obviously our owner, uh, Tab Tito Francona, to be the leader of our franchise. Um, the culture, sustained culture of winning starts at the top, and uh, we have the best. He is now with the retirement of Bruce Bochy over in San Francisco. Tito is the winningest active manager in baseball. Uh, I think it's up to, he'll get mad at me that I don't know the number. I think it's 14 straight seasons, maybe 18 straight seasons, winning seasons as a manager. It's pretty remarkable in the game of baseball what he's been able to achieve. Um, with injuries and things of that nature, your team can take a, 
a downturn for one year and just to have an off year, he just doesn't allow it. His ability, his authenticity as a leader, which I happen to think is the most important uh, quality in leadership, is authenticity. Uh, if you try to be somebody you're not, the people that work for you uh, just are going to see right through it and and uh, your your leadership skills are going to be questioned. So um, we're very fortunate uh, that we have a guy like Tito uh, at the helm. Seven straight winning seasons. In those seven years, we've won something near 638, 640 wins. It's the most in the American League in seven years. We've won the most regular season games of any team in the American League for seven straight years. Only the Los Angeles Dodgers have won more regular season games the last seven years than the Cleveland Indians. Obviously, we haven't crossed the finish line, which is our ultimate goal is to win a World Series. We've had four straight seasons of 90-plus wins. The last time that happened in our franchise, most people in this room would probably say the 90s, right? The great juggernaut teams of the 90s. Nope. <laughs> Yeah, it was the 50s group. The Bob Feller, the Larry Dobies, the Lou Boudreaux, Bob Lemon, Mike Garcia, that crew uh, won 90-plus games six years in a row, 1950 through 1955 season. Um, they were obviously a remarkable group that uh, got close but uh, couldn't derail the uh, – the evil empire, the New York Yankees, um, during that period of time. Um, so the sustained culture that we have working, um, it really is a product of people, how we believe in people, how we treat our people, how we provide our people with the greatest resources possible, both on the baseball and the business side. Um, we have to rebrand ourselves. It's something I think as all of us business people in this room, we have to rebrand ourselves almost every year from a, a baseball perspective. Each year off season brings a unique perspective to how we're going to build a baseball team. We're not built uh, like the NBA um, where you grab one superstar or two superstars and that's your team and you can build around it and try to win. We used 12 different starting pitchers last year. 12 different starting pitchers last year. Um, we have to build a team in addition to build an organization that's focused on taking care of the people inside our organization. Last time we used 12 pitchers. I think it was 2008 or 9, and we only won 60 games, 65 games, I think it was. What we were able to accomplish this past year using 12 different starters with all the injuries that we had was pretty remarkable. Um, we were elated. Um, it was a source of elation for us that it showed that our um, farm system, our player development process, how we go about providing the resources and the instruction um, to our players, our people in the organization was working, and it was working well. Um, Zach Meisel of The Athletic, if you are really into sports um, and you're not quite getting all you want from The Plain Dealer or Cleveland.com, uh, The Athletic is a remarkable um, a place to go. They they cover our local scene and the national scene uh, um, incredibly well. Zach Meisel's a Solon High School kid that uh, um, really one of the top writers around. He just wrote a, a column about pitching ninjas. The Cleveland Indians have created pitching ninjas is how we were able to sustain our winning culture this year because we had three kids come up through the system all drafted in 2016 and end up doing well for us. Um, and it's a mindset of how we teach them. Corey Kluber is one of the first examples, two-time Cy Young Award winner, first example of that, 
how we taught him when we acquired him. People may forget this, but we acquired him in a trade when he was a double-A pitcher for San Diego. And he came into our system, got into our process, our system, and how we create pitching because we can't go out. I just heard on the radio walking in here, the two big pitchers in baseball, Garrett Cole, Steven Strasburg, are going to the winter meetings to sit to meet with the Yankees and a few others. Well, they're not going to sit and meet with us or the Reds or the Pirates or the Twins or the Royals or all the 15 middle market teams in baseball. They're not sitting with any of us. If we want to be good, we have to create and develop and produce our own stud pitchers, first and foremost. And we've gone through the effort of working with sports psychologists, sports nutritionists, the taking advantage of all the new sports science, the mindset of the discipline of not just the day you stand on the mound, but the four days in between that are more important than the day that you stand on the mound to get you ready and prepared. Being prepared is what all of our businesses are all about, taking care of our people, being prepared. And our guys in our baseball operations department have done an incredible job couple names, Ruben Niebla, who just got promoted to be the assistant pitching coach for the Cleveland Indians, guy by the name of Tony Arnold. These are guys who have been in our organization for 15, 20 years in the minor leagues, teaching our kids uh, the right way to go about the business, the mindset of pitching, first pitch strikes, get a good first inning, um, all the things necessary to be disciplined, to be the best that you can be. Um, that, to us, was a real source of elation this last year. Um, one other one, at the end of the year, uh, Progressive Field was ranked the number one ballpark in all of America by a group called Stadium Journey. Uh, there is this group called Stadium Journey. They visit every stadium, arena, ballpark in America. They do the secret shopping thing. They don't call us in advance and say we're coming so we can spruce the place up and take them on a tour and, and treat them nicely. They just buy their own tickets at the window or in advance, and they walk in and they have seven different, uh, I think they do it through the lens of seven different categories, um, ranking teams one through, uh, ranking each category one through five, five being the best. Um, we receive fives in everything from, uh, food and beverage, to atmosphere, to friendliness, to um, one in-game entertainment. Uh, they have one category called extras. I wasn't quite sure. They didn't really describe that in the article, what that meant. I think that's just an add-on in terms of just the whole overall experience. Uh, the only thing we didn't get a five in, we're at 486 um, the highest rating of all teams, um, San Francisco Giants were number two, um, as you would expect, uh, PNC Park. I, I don't know if you've ever visited that in Pittsburgh. It's terrific. Same architect that did ours. Um, and then Wrigley Field and, and Fenway are in the top five. Uh, um, the only one we didn't get a five on and we got a four was Access. It was pretty odd since we're right off the highway. Um, you could see it from miles away. Um, but uh, we're incredibly uh, proud of, of that because it's we take care of our people. We go, you know, we know that all the violent, all the people who are our ushers and ticket takers, many are retired. Um, we run them through a whole lot of service training activities prior to the season. They have an incredible passion to take care of our fans. They have an incredible passion for the Cleveland Indians and for what they do. And um, it really, uh, I think, all the effort we put into that, the, the effort of customer service uh, really uh, came to bear in this, uh, in this survey. Um, frustration, obviously no postseason. Simple as that, Seven winning, seventh winning season. Um, it's not a statistic we're going to hang our hat on, but it makes you feel better when you're not the last guy standing. The Washington Nationals are the only ones that can stand at the end of the season and say we had a good year. 
um, out of the 30 baseball teams. They're the World Series champions. What a remarkable World Series it was, too. An incredibly entertaining World Series, although we wish we would have been a part of it. It was still fun to watch. Um, but the fact that we won 93 games last year, two more than the year before, and in the two wild card era, it's the first time ever a team that had won 93 games didn't get in. So we can hang our hat on that, that we did well. Normally we would have gotten into the postseason. Um, the other frustration was we don't know what the hell the Twins were doing winning 101 games. We knew they were going to be good. We knew they were going to be a challenge. Like this coming season, we know both the Twins and the White Sox uh, are going to challenge us in the American League Central Division. Um, but the frustration um, really hit home with all the injuries that I talked about that we just had. There's a calculation of lost value. We had the second most lost value from missed players uh, over the Yankees last year. And for us to overcome that um, was really something special, which leads us to what did we discover through that uh, frustration and all those injuries. We discovered, as I mentioned earlier, that the process is working. That the, the things that we have put in place, especially with our young pitching, um, Mr. Savale, Mr. Shane Bieber, who was the All-Star Game MVP, had a remarkable season, almost a Cy Young uh, type season. Zach, please Zach. All were in the same draft. 2016, here's three kids in 2016 come to our organization in mid-June. They have a minor leagues of a brief period in, in 16. They're all college pitchers, so they had a big workload. So they didn't pitch a lot for us in 16. We try to, you know, make sure that we treat them right with the, the amount of work that they do in the college game. And then they had the 2017 season. We saw Shane Bieber up in Cleveland a little bit in 17. Uh, and then uh, in 18 as well. And all of a sudden, we've got three winning pitchers um, help us uh, in 2019 from the same draft. So uh, that's how we have to do it. And these kids are part of what Zach Meisel called the Pitching Ninja Academy that we have at the Cleveland Indians. Um, the discovery aspect is probably one of the most fun things that, that happens during a baseball season. And Oscar Mercado, uh, a kid we traded for a couple of years ago that nobody even knew about the trade at the trading deadline two years ago. We traded two Class A outfielders to the St. Louis Cardinals for a single Triple A outfielder. Didn't get a lot of buzz because that gentleman went right from the AAA team of the Cardinals to the AAA team of the Cleveland Indians, Oscar Mercado. This last year, uh, he comes to spring training, shows Terry Francona he means business, he wants to be on this baseball team, and he took over center field. And uh, that kind of discovery is, is pretty awesome. Fran Mil Reyes in right field uh, this coming year, uh, we'll see. We've asked him to refine his body. Uh, he's a big boy. He's about 6'7", 270. Um, he can hit a ball a long, long way. Uh, hit almost 40 homers this year. 24-year-old uh, kid to get in a trade. The chief piece was Trevor Bauer. Um, I thought it was a remarkable deal that our baseball guys got. To get big, power, young, right-handed bats, uh, which we didn't have in the minor leagues, uh, was a remarkable trade uh, for the Cleveland Indians. So we discovered some big right-handed power. He'll be number four in our lineup for years to come. Um, it'll be interesting to see, again, how he works hard to become an outfielder instead of a DH at the age of 24. That's too young to just be a, a designated hitter. Um, the discovery, rediscovery of Carlos Santana. Coming back home, he was as happy as the happiest guy you've ever seen. It was like Christmas Day every day for him walking in to our clubhouse. He was so happy to be back in Cleveland, and his performance obviously showed it. 
Roberto Perez. Um, we trade Jan Gomes in the offseason last year, and people were wondering what we were thinking because Roberto had struggled offensively. Um, were we going to hand over the team to this young man? Consider this statistic. He won a gold glove this year as the best defensive catcher in baseball. 993-plus innings behind the plate. Zero pass balls. Last time that happened in the game of baseball, and what that is is the pitcher throws the ball and it gets by you. There's wild pitches and there's pass balls. When it gets by you, the official scorer determines the pitcher just made a horrible pitch, wild pitch. We're going to give him that stat. Catcher was lazy, didn't get in front of the ball. That's a pass ball. Zero. And not almost a 1,000 innings of work on a bum ankle. He had surgery on his right ankle uh, about four days after the season ended. Last time that happened in baseball, 1975 with the great Johnny Bench. Pretty remarkable uh, what he was able to do um, as the leader of this baseball team and guiding that young staff to the lowest ERA for starters in the American League. Twelve different starting pitchers, and he guided them to the lowest ERA. Um, an incredible discovery. Um, we've got some um, work to do this offseason. We've got to fill either third base or second base, depending upon which um, way our guys go. Jose Ramirez will either be a third baseman or a second baseman. All he's asked of our guys is when he gets to spring training that he knows which position he's going to play and he's not moved off that spot. He doesn't want to go back and forth. He wants to concentrate on playing one, and he returned we found the rediscovery of Jose Ramirez this year and his bat that went away for a little bit, um, but it's back and he turned into one of the top players in the game of baseball. Um, we have, we think, the best starting rotation in the American League. Uh, our guys know how to put a bullpen together. They've pieced it together every year. Again, the off season is all about building a baseball team that you can be proud of that has a chance to to win a divisional title and, and play baseball deep into October. Two quick business things, and then we open it up to questions. One I talked about a little earlier, Tribe Fest. If you have uh, your son's daughters, nieces, nephews, grandsons, granddaughters, uh, it's a fun day down at uh, the convention center Saturday, February 1st. Go to indians.com backslash tribe fest and uh, get your tickets for that. It really is a, a fun, fun day of baseball in, in the dead of winter. Um, also, if you're thinking about uh, great holiday gifts, I don't know if there's a better one than tribe six packs. So go to indians.com backslash six packs. It's a flex pack this year. You want to put something awesome in a stocking or give somebody young a great um, Christmas present, you get to pick. This year it's more of a flex pack <clears throat> where you get to select certain dates. You can select promo dates. If they're fireworks fans, rock and back blast fans, they're bobblehead fans, jersey, they're, those types of uh, events are available now. As you identify, you're not previously, you were picked on the six days that we said the six pack. Now you get to pick and choose over the course of different dates to, uh, um, and the tickets are obviously priced at depending upon the seat location you choose. So um, keep that in mind for the holiday. Now with that, who wants to be Frankie Lindor, the great Frankie Lindor and be our leadoff hitter. He's had three straight years of 30 homers, uh, one of the most remarkable uh, athletes that has come through uh, the Cleveland Indians organization. The hot stove is hot when it comes to the name Frankie Lindor, um, for sure. Um, before anybody asks about Frankie, I'll just say um, Two more years under contract with the Cleveland Indians, 2020 and 2021. Um, whether he gets moved, who knows. Uh, that's been the, one of the top uh, discussions. If you, lived in the, uh, if you lived in Chicago, 
Um, the Cubs are trying to think the same thing with their star, Chris Bryant, whether or not to trade him before he becomes a, tr a free agent. If you lived in Boston, um, Mookie Betts, their star right fielder, um, the Red Sox and the Cubs, two teams that have unlimited funds, are also talking about um, whether or not these young men should be traded before they become free agents and, and the team can't sign them. Um, we need to find a number that is respectful to Frankie Lindor and what he deserves in the game of baseball to be paid. But it also needs to be respectful to the Cleveland Indians organization and our ability to put a winning baseball team on the field. And that's the process that we're in right now, trying to see if there's a number that fits those two uh, issues. And uh, he's just a remarkable, remarkable talent. So you'll, throughout the rest of this off season and in the spring training, that's what you're gonna read about, frankly, Frankie, Frankie, which uh, uh, just to give you a little sense of payroll, payrolls are such a bizarre thing. Um, because two years ago, Frankie Lindor was paid $633,000 to hit 33 homers, uh, win a gold glove, be a great player. Last year, he made $10 million. So this year, he'll probably make, in arbitration, if he goes to arbitration, 16 to 18. So in those three years, his salary would go from 633000 to $10 million to $18 million. Payroll, as you put a team together, it fluctuates with young players, not, you know, from zero to three years making a certain amount of money, and then arbitration years making money, and then you free agency making more money. I would just ask if anybody in this room, if you thought that the Cleveland Indians and our market size would have a payroll in the middle of the pack amongst the 30 baseball teams that we're doing something right, that we can't compete with the Dodgers and the um, Cubs and the Yankees and the Mets and the Red Sox and the Phillies and that, those groups in the major markets, you'd be right. Paul Dolan is in the middle uh, of the pack when it comes. When we talk in terms of revenue, um, expenditures, we spend, of all the revenues we take in, we spend about 70% of those revenues on baseball. The 200 plus athletes that are in the Cleveland Indians organization, the 120 staff that take care of those 200 athletes. We have academies around the world. We have scouts around the world, the sports science, the analytics, some teams have analytic departments that are 20 strong now. We have eight guys uh, up in the corner of fourth floor sitting there doing their, their thing. The head of all that, you know what his title is? This is, as you heard earlier, this is my 40th year, um, 40 plus years in this crazy business. But the guy that leads the charge of all our analytics in baseball, his title is Chief Data scientist. <laughs> Never thought I'd hear that one coming in for a Cleveland Indians baseball team, but that's what it's all about. You have to take advantage of it. We use it on the business side. We use it on the, the baseball side. We spend 70% of our money on uh, baseball. We spend 33% on the business side. There you go. It's more than 100%, which means what? We're, we're losing money. How many of you guys go into business knowing you're going to lose money every year? Yeah, nobody raises their hand whenever I ask that. Only you expect us to. You expect Paul Dolan to lose money every year because he's our, the steward of our baseball team. And we do so. And we do so with large numbers, with the hopes that we are going to bring a World Series championship to our town. Uh, that's the commitment of ownership that uh, we deficit spend with regularity. Um, so nobody asked a question, but I answered two of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. You, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, he's got the microphone. Sorry. Uh, 
President Tobin in his weekly email to our club said there are two things you can count on in December. One of those is Santa Claus, and the other is Bob DiBiasio. <laughs> <laughs> too kind, too kind. Well, thank you for coming. But I do have a question about analytics. Yes, sir. Which, uh, as I understand it, the, the current thinking is that you should have a starting pitcher in for four, somewhere between four to five innings. Yes. And then change relievers every one to two innings. Right. All of which makes the game longer and longer and longer. And I'm just curious if you have any comment on that. Yeah. No, and, and believe me, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? You will sit there and the first uh, four or five innings of ball game will go by rapidly. And then all of a sudden it's a death knell. Boom. It stops because of the parade. I don't know – if we're going to hear this weekend, winter meetings start on Sunday, if the commissioner is going to make the announcement that a reliever has to come in and face three batters, is the one rule that they have been talking about for the last couple of years. And since they've been talking about it for the last couple of years, there's some real seriousness to it. Um, our manager hates it. <laughs> Our manager is one who the reason we win 93 games because he's smarter than the guy in the other dugout and can mix and match our, our relievers to their hitters so that we limit people scoring late. Scoring late in a ball game um, is either if it's you doing it, the greatest thing in the world, or the other team doing it is the worst thing in the world. Obviously, you have less innings to catch up if you allow a team to score late. His use of a bullpen is remarkable, and that's why Tito does not like this rule. The rule would be you have to come in as a reliever and face three batters. Unless you come in with two outs, you get the guy that you – first guy you face, you're done. Somebody else can come in and, you know, pitch at the start of the inning. So you either finish out an inning – or face at least a minimum of three batters. It's going to be interesting to see. The other rule change, they've asked a couple minor league uh, um, leagues to do the automated strike zone where there's a chip in the umpire's mask where he'll hear a beep and do a quick strike or ball. Or It's going to be very interesting. Wanting to use technology to its fullest, the technology's there. Again, you've heard this the last few years, so there's going to be a time when that definitely comes into play uh, in the game of baseball that you'll see the automated strike zone. Don't know when, but I'm anxious to, to see the news coming out of the winter meetings if, um, because, as you said, it the the game slows. Instead of having the parade of pitchers, a guy's got to face three. Might quicken the pace a little bit. Tito's biggest concern is, one, the way he manages his bullpen, and two, it just gives uh, the wealthy clubs, the big market clubs, an opportunity to corner the market in the bullpen. Get guys uh, that can do more. They can pay them more than the 15, 18 of us in middle market baseball. Yes, sir. Question tied back into the development aspect of the Indians. Yes. Uh, perspective on the proposal to contract the minor league systems. Yes. El eliminating the rookie leagues. Yeah. Um, there's some discussion that deals with, uh, and I mentioned we have 200 athletes. It's a very difficult decision Um the contraction of minor leagues, this isn't the first time it ever happened when Branch Rickey came into the game of baseball. He was one, as everyone knows, Branch Rickey's the one who, as president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, integrated baseball with Jackie Robinson. Shout out to Ohio Wesleyan University. Branch Rickey, a proud alum of Ohio Wesleyan, was a baseball coach at Ohio Wesleyan, and in 1901, he integrated college baseball at Ohio Wesleyan and said if he ever had an opportunity, if he ever got into baseball, this is one thing that he was going to do. It took him 46 years to become president of the Brooklyn Dodgers to uh, integrate baseball with Jackie Robinson. Um, but Brent Rickey started the farm system, and teams would have 22 farm teams back then when he first started. 
So they obviously contracted. We now, you know, triple A in Columbus, double A in Akron, uh, single A, high A is in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia, low A ball is Lake County. We have Mahoning Valley, which is the one that was thought of as a half season league that might get contracted. Um, we have a Dominican Academy, an Arizona Fall League, an Arizona Summer League. Um, the payment of the minor league player is the issue at the moment. And if we want to have 200 plus athletes, uh, we can't pay them like big leaguers, um, the minor leaguers. So the issue is how do we take care of these kids the best way possible when 4% have a chance to even put on a big league uniform? Do you, do you need that many farm teams is the way people are starting to look at it. It came out of another discussion as compensation to the minor leagues. Not sure where it's going. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how baseball handles that in the coming months. I do know that the commissioner sent a letter to Congress um, explaining his position. Um, and I think if you actually went to MLB.com, that letter would, would be there in the news section for people to, to read and get a little bit more info on that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Just comment on I just wanted to pick with some players you had for a couple of years, Bradley Zimmer. Yeah, Bradley, Bradley Zimmer. Zimmer. What what <coughs> is the deal with him? Can't stay healthy. Um, it's sad. You know, it's like Tyler Naquin. Uh, these guys run too fast in the walls. They're hard. You gotta stop that sort of thing. But how do you tell a kid to stop uh, playing hard? I mean, it's the hardest thing in the world, right? Yeah, you need softer, you need better padding. Uh, you know, Bradley Zimmer ran full speed at Yankee Stadium and just blew out his shoulder um, and spent a year and a half, almost two, rehabbing. And then in his rehab, he had a different injury. Um, you know, a number one draft pick out of the University of San Francisco. He's another one. He's 6'5", 230, uh, runs like a deer. Throws a baseball from the outfield to home plate 100 miles an hour. Um, just can't stay healthy. So I don't know. He's going to have to play triple A next year just to get his legs under him again and be a part of competition. He hasn't, he hasn't competed um, very much other than a brief period last year at Columbus. So, so how frustrating was it for the Indians to see the healthy year Michael Brantley had? Well, it you know, it was good and bad. You know, Michael Brantley, we love him to death. He's such a – and, again, guys don't want to be injured. They don't work to be <laughs> injured. So when injuries happen, you just feel horrible for him because I can honestly tell you the worst thing for an athlete um, is the isolation of rehab. Um, you don't feel part of the team. You have to get to the ballpark in the morning – um, and be out of the training room and out of the work room, uh, the strength and conditioning area, and all of those areas. You got to be out of there before the guys who are active come because they need the attention because they're playing. So you really feel out of it. Um, and uh, Michael had to suffer through a couple of years of that with us. Um, but yeah, it was it was tough uh, seeing him perform, but it was also nice to see him perform because. You know, we know what kind of guy he is and uh, what he's all about. So, um, but our job again this off season, um, uh, every off season bring, brings a unique set of challenges and how we go about building a baseball team. We need an outfielder. Uh, we're going to need a second or third baseman. See if we can augment the bullpen a little bit. Not a huge shopping list. Um, we expect to win our division this coming season. Um, the, the White Sox and the Twins, I think the White Sox are going to be the new darlings, even though they only won 70-some games. Uh, people will pick them as their young team is starting to get better. Um, but we expect to be there and, and to play baseball in October again. Always a treat to be with you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.
Bob, any chance you can stay around and just sure. answer some questions? I know that a bunch of folks will probably swarm around you here. Hey, one thing, when you mentioned the time it takes to play baseball, I loved one quote from Red Barber. Baseball is only dull for people with dull minds. <laughs> All right. Um, I like it too. Um, hey, next week we have Vocal Impact. The students from the, the uh, Hudson High School will come and perform. We're going to be meeting. We'll start out in the community room, okay? We'll listen to their performance. Then we will transition over here uh, for breakfast. So next week, meet in the community room. Um, get there early if you can. I don't know exactly what the logistics of it are, but we'll, we'll work that out And because uh, I know that they are on a tight schedule. Um, we're also going to be honoring some um, uh, widows and widowers next week. It'll be a, a little bit different uh, than, than usual, but um, we'll explain that next week. And then, um, let's see, Rodebach. I didn't even look at the ticket. I'm looking at that big ring that he's got on his finger. It's ridiculous. Last four numbers, 2572. 2572. Who do we got? All right, Donna. Payout today is $14. The jackpot is $144. That's for you. Please certify there's a black marble in there. Yeah. All right. Get lucky. Oh, I'm sorry. Try again next week, okay. please. And if there are no other pieces of business, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.